Okay, everyone. Good evening. It's seven o'clock, so let's get started and welcome to today's Chef and Air webinar. My name is Suzanne. I'm the communications coordinator of the World Duchenne Organization, and we're a worldwide collaboration of national patient organizations from rare muscle wasting conditions Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy. And I'm here together with Begonia Nefria, who works for the Saint Jean de Deux Hospital in Barcelona, and the team from Melanoma Patient Network Europe, or MPNE. And from MPNE, we have Bettina Rill, Giliosa Spurier Menard, and Violetta Astratine, who cooked up an educational webinar where they will touch base on the best practices and share years and years of experience in the field of patient advocacy and how to communicate in an effective way. So here you can see the agenda. Uh, Bogonia will start off with an introduction and an explanation of the Share for Air project. She will explain a bit how we are connecting these rare diseases, families around the globe in a safe and a secure way. And we show how we empower them to participate in research projects. And up next, we invite Bettina, Gilly and Violetta to give a lecture about online patient advocacy. So we talk about the importance of patient forums. We talk about how to use social media channels to share your knowledge and what is the best way to stay up to date in your areas of interest. And this will be followed by a discussion. And this uses the questions from the comment box as a guidance. So more about that in a minute. First, I'd like to explain to you how you can join the online conversation. So you see the ha you have the slides in front of you and you will be muted during the webinar. So that means your keyboard is your voice. So should you have any questions or comments during the webinar, you can connect to us using the comment box, which is in the top right corner, the small speaking bubble. So you can access it, uh, you can just type in your question uh, and from these questions and the discussion after the presentation will be moderated. So please use this comment kind of like as a digital chat box so we can have some input during the discussion. So this webinar will be recorded and made live on our YouTube channel. If you wish to take a look at it later, the channel is simply called Share for Rare. Uh, and there you can also check out earlier recorded webinars and more information about the project in both English and Spanish. So I hope that's all clear. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, I'd like to hand over the presentation to Begonia. She's the coordinator of patient engagement in research and the initiator of the Share for Air project who will explain the platform to you. So Begonia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Suryan. Welcome to all the people that it's uh, online in this webinar. It's my pleasure to explain to all of you which is you know, the Share for Air uh, project and which are the objectives that we are at this moment you know, working to, to achieve uh, all together because Share for Air is an online uh, platform to promote research uh, coming you know, from the patients to answer their needs. And obviously it's a, a, a platform that facilitates uh, the development of research projects with uh, direct involvement with the, with the patients. Okay, first of all, I want to explain a little bit what, which are the, the challenges that we want to, to face in our platform. As I said, for us, patients are the heart of our project. As you heard, uh, we are working with two important European patients organizations in the Share for Air Consortium, the Melanoma Patients Network in Europe and also the World Ocean Organization. For us, the patients are you know, a, a very important source of information to change the, the ecosystem of the rare diseases. According to this, we need you know, to, to face several challenges. One, it's uh, related to the small number of patients that uh, usually are suffering these rare diseases. It's so hard and in some cases so difficult to, to drive a project only with the patients that probably you know we can identify in one academic institution or hospital. Also, there is an important uh, limited uh, information about several rare conditions. It means that we need to improve a lot the knowledge that we can uh, provide to the, to the patients and the families. From the psychological perspective, usually patients and families suffering rare diseases, they feel uh, isolated because it's not common to find another patient or another family very close to you. And when I said close to you, I'm talking about geographical uh, distance. Sometimes it's so difficult to find an, uh, a family in the same country, even, even this. 
Also, uh, this no geographical uh, disper uh, dispersion uh, requires no, uh, a hard collaboration between patients at global level, not only at, at the European level. Also, for that one challenge, it's not the delay in the in the diagnosis because it's not easy in some cases to find the right diagnosis, and it takes uh, in some cases many years. And the last thing that we need to face is uh, relating not to this limited information that we have is that in some cases there is any information about the natural history of the disease. It means that we don't know exactly no, the cause of the disease and we cannot provide any advice to patients and families about how no, uh, the patient is going to, to live with the disease along the years. Said this, uh, we uh, know that social media and digital platforms allow to us no, probably to face these uh, challenges in terms that we can connect people around the world, we can collect no, this meaningful information from patients and families, and we can change a little bit no, the, the scientific knowledge and hopefully improve the quality of life of patients and, and families. It's the education. Let me go back one slide. It's the education of, uh, of the patients. We, we know that if we can provide meaningful information from uh, sources in which you know, we can trust, the quality of life and the management of the disease is better. And in this sense, in the public face of the platform, you will find a collection of several uh, books. These books have been uh, written by experts in the different diseases and basically offer information about the diseases in which we are at this moment running a research project. You will find this information in the public layer of the, of the platform. The second objective in which we are working in share forever is to share. We know that uh, this peer connection uh, it's good for the patients and obviously for the families and has no uh, important benefits from the psychological point of view how we work and how we offer the opportunity to share between the users in, in share for rare Basically, we work with the information that all of you can provide in the private environment of the platform. It means that to cover this objective, you need to be a, a user of share for rare When you uh, register to share for rare you need to declare the disease or if you are an undiagnosed patient, you need also to inform about the symptoms and also about the geographical location in the country where you are living. With all of this information, we have running in the platform algorithms of uh, artificial intelligence that allow to us to create this uh, map of connections, as you can see in the screen, that facilitate uh, to see where you are in this community, but also to find people that can have uh, common symptoms with you, the, probably the same disease and probably living in the same country. As you can see in your screen in the in the right side, there is a list of users of the platform and the percentage that you can see below every of the names means no, the, the coincidence and the commonalities that you can have with uh, this user. Uh, you can connect in a, in a private message to every of these uh, people in the in the platform. Also, we facilitate in this uh, tool that the name is people like me the opportunity to find patients organizations that are working in the defense of the rights of your disease. It means that also if you want, you can contact them or they can contact you if you have allowed to receive messages in the platform. And this is another way to find uh, peer support because not all the people living with a rare disease are member of a patient or of organizations. And the last objective and, and basically you know, the, the heart of share for rare is research. We are at this moment running four projects. I will explain afterwards which are these four projects. And basically all of them are working uh, to help to describe in a better way if it's uh, necessary or to start no, to, to describe the natural history of the disease, help uh, with these algorithms that I mentioned that we can have in the platform to facilitate the prognosis of the, of the patient to collect information that uh, it's very meaningful in many projects uh, related to rare diseases that are not the patient reported outcome measures. And obviously all the pool of patients that are participating in share for rare at the end can be engaged in another, in another project because we can support and facilitate other initiatives beyond the fourth uh, ones that at this moment are working in, in share for rare 
These are the research projects in which you know we are piloting the, the different functionalities of the platform. We have one dedicated to pediatric rare tumors. This is a, a small group of conditions in which uh, we know that we need to improve a lot the description of the natural history. We have another project dedicated to acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia. This project is focused to analyze the side effects of the treatment when the pediatric, uh, sorry, when the onset is pediatric and after five years of remission of the disease. We have another pilot project focusing the neuromuscular diseases in terms to analyze which is the burden of the disease uh, regarding the education and the access to, to a job position to, to the patients. And the fourth one is a pilot dedicated to, to the patients that they don't have a, a diagnosed and diagnosed patients because they represent the 20% of the users of share for rare nowadays and there is a, a, a big no, a gap of information about no, which are the, the needs of these uh, patients in the, in the European context. How does it work, uh, share for rare? I have mentioned that we have a public environment where you can find the blog and these medical books, but also the community of users, the people like me and, and the questionnaires related to the different pilot projects are in the private environment. It means that it's necessary to complete the registration form to access to the platform. In this registration uh, process, you will find uh, an informed consent document that you have to download and, and sign and, and complete and send to us. Also with a medical report that can, valid, that can help to us to validate that you will contribute to a specific rare condition. This is a, an important feature of our platform because it means that all the users are really patients, really caregivers, and also that we have no uh, check that they will uh, participate for a specific condition. You know that there are many platforms and initiatives uh, in rare diseases that only you know if you have a, a user in Facebook or in other social media network, you can access and you don't need any of these uh, activities like you no know, the informed consent or the medical report. For us, it's meaningful and it's you no know, part of the quality of the data and the information that we analyze from the path, from the from the patients in the platform to ensure you know, the, the identity of the users. And afterwards, you know, when you have completed all these uh, steps of the registration process, you will have access to these services that I have already uh, present to all of you. And this is basically you know, the general overview of the Share for Rare project. Obviously, the, the team that is behind of the platform, it's uh, open to receive any question or, or comment from you by email or if you want also afterwards in the in the time of questions and answers. Now I'm going to, to, to give the opportunity to explain no, from their huge experience to the team of, um, of the Melanoma Patients European Network about the topic of the webinar today, that it's about social media and, and the use for the advocacy in, in rare diseases. It's your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Begonia. And uh, we as a World Share Organization are really glad to work on projects like these to, to help build a global rare disease community and really make that difference in rare disease research. Uh, and one of these ways of making a difference is really to empower patients and their carers to effectively advocate for your rights and your needs. So that's indeed why we ask our project project partner MPNE, who collectively share a ton of experience on this, to dive deeper on this important in, uh, aspect. So a bit of introduction of the speakers who all share a personal connection to melanoma. We first have Bettina Real, who's the founder and the president of Melanoma Patient Network Europe. She has a strong scientific and research background, and she has an interest in patient-centered research. Next, we have Jilly, who is the vice president of MPNE, also the chair of WeCan, which is a network of leaders in cancer patient organizations, and she's the president of Melanoma France. And next, we have Violetta, who is a researcher with an interesting equitable access to cancer care and clinical trial design, and she's also the founder of Melanoma Romania. So thank you for being able to get on board, and uh, we're looking forward to hear your presentation. Hello, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us here. And uh, thank you for the very nice introduction, Susie, and Bego for the background on our project. So we now have something about uh, half an hour, and uh, we would like to share a little bit with you 
um, where we're coming from and how we ended up in uh, advocacy and what we think are valuable resources for anyone who is an advocate. So first about myself, Suzanne has already introduced me. I ended up in melanoma advocacy because I lost my husband to it. I wasn't a very uh, social media addict uh, before that, but we found out that it was extremely helpful for our patients. And uh, I would like my colleagues to at least say hello that you know who is online now. Gilly, are you there? Hi, yes, I'm Gilly Sparia bernard um, I am uh, the carer of a stage four patient still. For seven years, I have been caring for a stage four patient. Um, and I'm very pleased to be here and uh, very pleased to be part of this uh, great project for our pediatric melanoma patients. Hi, I'm Violetta. Hello, Violetta. Oh, we can see you, but we can't hear you. Otherwise, I would say we get started and give Violetta time to um, connect. So. We are all here for personal reasons. That's the website. This is the network we started. And Gilly already said that we were a partner in Chair for Rare because we hope to develop support for our pediatric patients. Because we have a rare or a very rare instances that cancer that usually hits adults also affects children. Now, um, the internet for us, it's a little bit what I think of as the best thing since sliced bread. And that's of course a totally ripped picture from a Disney film. But we'd like to walk you through a few features that we think make it so interesting for advocacy. So the first reason why we think that the internet is really, really helpful and has actually changed how we conduct patient advocacy as compared to before the, we had the internet is that it allows you to give you access to information and that in real time. We are the best educated patient population ever, and that is largely thanks to, to the internet. Then it is, of course, a fantastic communication tool as we are now all connected online. And uh, something we have noted, noted over the last, let's say, two years is that online translation tools actually make it possible to work or collaborate across language barriers without needing people who are actually totally bilingual uh, in, 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 uh, in two languages. Um, third point for us is that it helps you to find your tribe. In the past, you were confined to neighbors or people in your city. Now, of course, our reach has increased dramatically and uh, just the mere fact that uh, Violetta, for example, lives in the Netherlands and Gilly lives in France and I live in Sweden, uh, but we probably have a closer connection to each other than I definitely have here to my neighbors and maybe I should shut my window now. Um, I think it's a classic case for what finding your tribe means. And last but not least, it also offers the, the tools for new ways of working together and really producing things that was not a, that was just simply not possible before. Now, as most nice things in life, it comes, it's a double-edged sword and it comes with positive and negative, negative sides to it. So um, I'm not gonna go through all this detail. You will have the slide deck afterwards, but I'm sure you have heard about fake news and how, dangerous that can be especially for vulnerable mm, people like patient population uh, the same is happening now for covid so that's why i was a bit stopping at the word patient um i think fake news are dangerous for everyone and we are trying to with it in the next um, short half an hour trying to balance a little bit how we think you can get the positive out of it without falling um, for, for the negative and how one can kind of anticipate and mitigate some of the risks that also come with the medium. Because in the end, the internet is a tool for us to use and a tool is neither good nor bad, it is what we use it for. And with that, Gilly will walk you through the next session on how to access valid information. Over to you, Gilly. Thanks, Bettina, for that. Um, so accessing valid information. Um, Basically, we, we have a process where we're wanting to find valid information in the first place, choose what's good, what's useful to us, and then we will see, as we, we discuss this a bit further, that there are access issues. So if to, to, to start in, in our area of science and, and medicine, um, we can start with um, um, tools like, like PubMed and Google Scholar, which are great because you can search it without all the advertising and all the other stuff and the ancient stuff and the rubbish that comes through. So it's a very good place to start. And also they have excellent references. Um, I'm all for making other people do the work. So if you 
use things like Medscape and front, the Frontiers uh, uh, system. So we have Frontiers in Ecology, or Frontiers in various uh, other disease areas. Um, and uh, things like for us in, in rare cancers and cancers, we have eCancer. You can actually, they've done all the searching for you already. So they, they've kind of uh, distilled it down to a nice usable form. And again, there's lots of references that you can use to go into tangents. Um, then once you've found what you need to be looking for, now you need to choose what's actually relevant and what's useful. Now, where do you go to choose good quality, valid uh, information? Now, there's various, in, in our field, there are various uh, good publications, and these are selected as good publications, if you like, because of what we call impact factor. Now, impact factor is basically just, they, they, they take an average of all the, all the uh, public, um, articles published, and they see how many times that article gets cited. Um, and obviously, if it's a good publication, and people trust it, and people want to reuse it, they will cite that, that publication over and over again, and they will have a, a much better in, impact score. So in the cancer field, it's things like the Lancet, Science, um, nature, uh, the New England Medical Journal. So these things are the kind of areas, but in your own areas of disease, you will have specialities that are uh, that you should also know about and you should make it your business to find out about. Um, the, the problem then is, is you find your nice article and you're really pleased that you've got exactly what you want and you find suddenly that there's no access to it. You can get the abstract and that's it. And this is, as advocates, the bane of our life. And it makes me mad when we can't actually access uh, uh, articles that perhaps we have even contributed to in terms of uh, uh, being on a clinical trial and yet we don't have access to it. So there are ways. Um, that uh, you can access. There's free free access to, to paywall papers, um, and here's there's a there's a few of them. And if you have the add the add-ons onto your your browser, if you like, you can read some of these articles for free. Uh, and I'm only telling you about the legal ones. Obviously, there are some illegal ones, um, but obviously, but this is not the place to do that here. Um, then there's also repositories, which are very useful, like ResearchGate. You will have. It's quite useful if you want to search an individual person who you know writes about your subject, um, who, who's a, a, a key opinion leader in your field and you know they published in that thing, it's quite useful to put their name in and you'll come up with everything that they've published. Academia is, is something pretty similar. Okay, so and then we have educational resources because all of us need education, whatever level we are. Um, and these resources are, are out there. And this is what we love the internet for. And people will always say don't Google, but really, there's such an amazing amount of stuff there if you know where to look in the right places. Wikipedia is a great place to start. Now, if you're in a rare disease, you're not going to find very much about your rare disease in Wikipedia. But you do find a lot of very useful stuff on the basics, on genetics, you know, because we all have to learn from a, a point of knowing nothing. So the, the basics of how cells work, of how bodies work, how, how genetics works, Wikipedia is great for. And again, they have really good resources. Don't forget the resources at the bottom. Conference resources. All of us have conferences, whether it's the, the, the rare conferences or, or our own cancer conferences. Use their resources. Often you have to have been in order to be able to access these. But, uh, you know, hopefully all of us go to our, our key conferences. Um, organizations' websites. Obviously, Eurodis has quite a lot on there. The UPATI toolkit is, is another great one to be able to use from the whole rare, rare uh, area. Um, European projects is a good one because in all our fields, we have aspects where a project has been worked on in our, in our field. And if you follow these, and all European projects generally have to have uh, a dissemination and education part to it. So they are sort of obliged to, to in, in Form about what's happening on their project. And then there's online courses. There's a huge number of these and some of them are really good. We have Future Learn, we have uh, many, many others. So please get out there and look for the, few, for the, the free ones. Um, there we go. I'm not really going to go through the dangers of fake news because we've already done a webinar on this. So please find that on the YouTube channel for Share for Rare. Um, because it's a really important area and we've dedicated a, a whole section to that. Um, and now I'm going to pass on to Violetta for the communication. Yes, thank you very much. It's good. I skipped my presentation, so I will uh, try to give you a couple of words about uh, my, my background. I'm a PhD biologist, core member of Melanoma Patient Network Europe and founder of Melanoma Romania. 
uh, and I have lost my sister to melanoma in 2014. Since then, I am very active in online education of patients and patients advocates. Um, mostly, I'm interested in explaining science and share uh, uh, news about the research and science in my field in melanoma. And um, I think six, six years and four years in uh, several patient uh, organizations like Dutch Melanoma Foundation, Melanoma Romania, and of course the European uh, Melanoma Network. Um, I will, of course, uh, communication is uh, the most important uh, for us, and online communication is uh, what we are busy with every day besides face to face meetings. I will ask Suzanne to, I have control to this. Uh, Presentation, Suzanne, please help me with the next slide. So, what is this slide about? We tried here to give you to describe our experience in using different media channels. And uh, what what you want, I would like to keep uh, in mind is that there is no perfect. Uh, uh, social media uh, channel and everything uh, should uh, be chosen actually according with the purpose, according with your uh, audience. Uh, and, and what we try to do uh, is to maximize the, the advantages of a uh, social media channel and to minimize the disadvantages. So um, the most used channels in, uh, in our uh, work are, of course, and I think this is the experience of everybody, Facebook, uh, Twitter, we, ha we have also our preferences for Slack, Trello, uh, YouTube and uh, LinkedIn. Uh, what is uh, um, nice and uh, less uh, uh, interesting about each of uh, these channels, for Facebook, for, for Facebook you, you know that uh, you can uh, reach a lot of uh, patients. It's the easiest way to uh, to uh, educate the large communities. Um, it's the easiest way to uh, activate closed private uh, forum, to engage in personalized, to, to offer personalized information uh, to, to patients. And of course, it's a way to, um, let's say, uh, perform uh, adult education because adults, they have a certain way to, to learn and to, to use what they learn in their benefit. Of course, Facebook is not so good to reach oncologists and researchers. Uh, they are not so much on uh, on Facebook, and if they are, they are not active to our disappointment. Uh, but uh, uh, and uh, what is uh, let's say a disadvantage uh, again is the fact that uh, it's very difficult to ensure pri privacy. We know that, and it's difficult to keep uh, away the advert. Adver uh, adver uh, uh, some ads and uh, the discussion about uh, food supplement uh, pseudoscience and and so on. Uh, Twitter, Twitter. Um, <clears throat> to be uh, honest, uh, Twitter is a, a great tool to learn a lot in the very short uh, time. Uh, you can find a lot uh, about uh, new topics. You can screen, uh, for example, all the uh, a lot a lot of. Uh, uh, research and uh, articles that are recently published and you can pick up your topics and uh, uh, make up your post for the for the uh, forum or your public page so twitter is very very nice when screening a large amount of information uh, and uh, uh, also it's very interesting that you can use it uh, to signalize problems for example we had once uh, a problem with the with the clinical trial with a fake clinical trial for, on clinicaltrial.com uh, and uh, uh, what uh, clinical trials uh, and uh, what happened it was that we uh, um, highlighted that via twitter to bms to the sponsor and uh, the text was fixed immediately um, of course, it's not good Twitter for uh, patient support and uh, extensive uh, discussions. So, uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, what you pick up on Twitter, some, sometimes Twitter is very good to um, 
look to screen for collaborators and uh, sometimes you keep a, uh, you you just uh, meet uh, via twitter a very interesting person and uh, you want to collaborate and then you you can uh, on the other hand go on linkedin and then you can uh, uh, verify uh, cv and uh, and uh, the uh, biography of that person and of course uh, it's a very uh, efficient way to to learn about uh, about uh, people um <clears throat> now what uh, what is uh, very um, uh, difficult not not very difficult but is uh, not very comfortable on uh, on linkedin it's to uh, engage in discussions people are not very comfortable with discussion but uh, uh, on the other hand the level of uh, discussion it's uh, it's uh, it's high and this is um, this is good. Uh, be careful also on LinkedIn that you can have a lot of self promotion. So not uh, not all the endorsements are are uh, really are real. Um, sorry, just doing something. <clears throat> so uh, now we have Slack. Slack is our um, internal uh, platform and we find it uh, brilliant, we find it uh, very good for uh, project management and internal communication. And uh, uh, But on the other hand, we, we can divide discussion there per project, we can manage volunteer, but on the other hand, it's not very good for pre uh, prioritization. To go faster than what other platform that we, uh, we like very much is Trello. And we use Trello because it has these nice uh, uh, boards where you can uh, visualize uh, your activities and uh, like, like post-its on, on the world. And um, uh, we use it, in, as I said, in event organization or for a public repository for, for, uh, for papers. Uh, not so good for interaction, uh, of course. And uh, YouTube. YouTube, as we know, uh, is uh, perfect for visual uh, learning. Uh, we can explain science, we can explain concepts, for example, this concept of uh, immune system fighting cancer. Um, sometimes we uh, uh, upload the movies that we are, uh, videos that we are uh, with interesting uh, session uh, that we, we took during our conferences. So, uh, and YouTube, of course, the disadvantage is it's, uh, it's uh, not uh, so uh, good for the discussion. So uh, this is uh, uh, something just to share some uh, some bits from uh, from our experience, and uh, I think uh, now my colleague Bettina can uh, can continue with the with the presentation. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Violeta. So Thank you. Uh, this was this was just, of course, um, a sample of uh, what's out there, and this is our experience. And I'm sure you are using different ones. You see, for example, that Instagram is something that we are personally not. Uh, not using. That doesn't mean it has no use. It's just something that hasn't crossed us, or we tested it and it didn't. It didn't work at the time for us. Um, something that's also I think worth noting is that it evolves. So we've tried things and then dropped when they no longer, if they were no longer fit for purpose. So I think the the lesson to learn from that is that you have to create and and take care of your own little mix of tools that are suitable for your needs. And I'm sure we all have slightly different needs. However, once you have identified channels that you think work for you, you want to communicate something there. And there is something about patient information or information written for patients rather, that has to be correct in order to be effective. And we have over time developed some internal rules that we actually had never really formalized until we joined Chef Aurea and tried to tell others about it because we could tell you like, yeah, that's how we do it, but we couldn't really put criteria to it. So um, what came out of, of that effort is what we now call V2A2, just to remind ourselves what it stands for. And it is actually four domains that we have identified as critical in order to make patient information good information. We won't have the time to really walk you through all the detail of this. We are preparing, we are currently preparing a publication on the topic and we're happy to uh, take this another time. But the four domains that we consider important are validity, verifiability, accessibility and agency. And I will shortly go into each of them. Obviously, the information that we provide to patients and that is also information that we share. So it's not just information we write ourselves has to be valid and something like the date when it was written and by whom it was written do matter 
we don't think it is sufficient that you can say this has been written by expert X because anyone can pretend to be an expert on the internet. So we pay a lot of attention that any claims are verifiable. And that means that any claims are supported by evidence. So they source where they're coming from actually. That does not always have to be a scientific paper because it could be that a patient, for example, has a question or has heard it or read it on a different forum. That is totally valid to post and to share as long as you state, I heard this somewhere or I read this somewhere. So it is more about the traceability where it is coming from than a selective criteria. Accessibility is something that I think is quite, um, quite tricky if you're in the medical field, and I'm sure most of us here are, are in one disease or the other, because we know that the medical vocabulary is tricky by definition. So what is considered accessible language usually stipulates a certain age of education. And, um, but the, 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 the difficult part is trying to write medically valid information at a level or at that level is nearly impossible. There are online tools where you can simply copy and paste your text into this tool and it will give you a score. There are different types of tools for that, different types of scores, and you can develop a little bit of a feeling of how difficult the text is. There are some simple rules and we put them onto the tool on the right side and I apologize for it being a bit tricky to read because it's so small, but it is something, for example, how long your sentences are and uh, my native language is German, I can tell you it's not so easy to write short, concise sentences if you're used uh, to something else. And there is a certain style that helps to make a text easy, easier to understand. And that's, for example, the active voice. So these are tools that you can apply to a text. Agency is something that we particularly care about because in the end you do, you provide information with an aim, you have a goal with it. And we believe that the goal of any patient education is to increase the range of possibilities and opportunities for a patient. So you want to increase the action radius of a patient and you can only do that if you provide information in a way that enables that person to take further action. So that is something that I think we have all as community have to focus on because otherwise we keep people dependent on us just keeping providing information and that is not, at least for us, that's not the ideal and that's not our goal. This is applicable for any type of information. I, for example, use it on my own text. I've been criticized a lot about writing too complicated text. So I use this tool for myself just to make sure that I like follow and I kind of remind myself to be short and concise and fulfill these criteria. But we also use it when we get, and many of, I'm sure many of you will be asked to review patient information for your organization or for others. Um, it's a helpful guide to walk through it and make sure you cover all of these domains. So we have this made this little tool and you can just go yes and no, and it's not supposed to be absolute, but we find it's like a little mental help to, to, make, it, um, to make it easier and make sure that the end product is uh, of a consistent quality. Now, uh, next slide. Now we come actually to the third point I had mentioned at the beginning, namely online communities. Lots of us went online when we were first in contact with a disease to find people like ourselves, someone who has been there, someone who understands what we were going through. And now I think as patient advocates, what we have turned into is like, now we are the ones running these communities. Most of us went looking for support, but now we ended up being the ones who provide that support. Three points that I consider very, very important for what I think of as a good online community is that it provides a safe environment. The online community should be safe. It should have a respectful tone and it should be constructive and helpful. And it is important for us to understand that we do not own people. People can belong to our forum, they can also be on other forums, just like ourselves. We also have different roles. We are partners and parents and advocates and we have a professional role and we have different interests and we should expect our people to be on different forums and to belong to different communities. And actually that's helpful because it can help us to reach our goal once one has understood that. 
However, while you know that people are part of different communities, you need a certain amount of control. And control sounds slightly negative, um, but I do believe it is about finding the right level of control. First, you cannot be there all the time. So you have to find a mechanism that the entire environment is more or less self-controlling or you have enough people who can look over it because you will need sleep and then something can happen. And I think most of us running forums had nasty surprises then. Of course, that's not something you would wish on anyone. And then something I alluded on to earlier uh, is the problem of fake news. How do you keep fake news out? And that would validate or that for that we would need another webinar altogether. Um, just on that single point. Um, then in addition to that, I believe that one needs an overall vision and strategy. What one wants this community for? It's not just a group of people coming together, though that's already helpful. We believe that you need a, a vision where you want your group to go and uh, that I formulated and give a man a fish versus teach a man to fish strategies. Some forums just simply provide information and they are there as information sources. And in a way, people that makes them people dependent on someone else providing the information. So for our purpose or our own network, we have the aspiration that people that we want to enable people to go looking for information themselves and then actually bring it back. So we are more interested in enabling people to go out for themselves instead of making them dependent on us. And the last bit, and I have worked on genetic networks in the past, a little network theory goes a long way and can actually help you to get better in building your communities and maintaining your communities. And I'm going to um, explain a little bit in a second why. Now, what we have seen is, and I alluded to that already when I said why we went on to do went onto the internet looking for, for, uh, for people. People joining our communities come for two reasons. They're looking for information and they're looking for a community. That is someone like me, someone walking my shoes, someone who understands me. That's the social aspect. On the other hand, they have very concrete information needs. They want something, they have a question, they will have to decide on a treatment or they wanna know whether someone else is experiencing the same side effects they are having. So they have a very concrete question and they're looking for an answer to that very question. They often, are not medically trained because of course most people aren't medically trained so what we have known today is that they lack systemic knowledge so a very particular challenge that we as patient advocates are having is are actually anticipating educational needs and my colleague Violetta will talk a little bit about uh, that um, um, afterwards um, because that's something we have invested quite some time thinking about because ideally you want to have the information ready before the person knows that they need it but I promised you something on um, on network theory first. Uh, no, I probably, no, I don't wanna mess this up. So if you understand a little bit about how networks work, you can actually make your social or interfere or well interact with your social network in a very specific way. Now I want you to, I know that these look like little spider some things, but I want to look you to go the upper row and to the left. Imagine these blue dots are people in your network and the lines are connections that these people have. So for now, they are all kind of blue and thin. Now, these two, there are two circles in there that have a red ring. Just imagine you start, you pick these two people from your network and you put a lot of effort into these two people and you send them, for example, to a conference or provide them with extra training or send them to the UPATI course, for example. Now, when these people come back and share that knowledge, and that is of course assuming that the knowledge just travels one node to the next person, see what you have achieved. So you see that the knowledge reaches a few other people, those namely connected to the two dots you have chosen on the upper panel. If we now go to the panel below, same thing, same like the same group of people. However, you've chosen two different people. You will see that the red ring is now around two different people in this spider net. Now, if you now move from the left side to the right side, you have done the same thing. You have sent two people on a training course, but look what happens. You, because on the lower panel, these two people you have chosen are very well connected in your communities. The knowledge they have acquired is now suddenly reaching a way larger group and of course this is an optimized one no it's not true that everyone is connected to everyone and that's actually something you even wouldn't want 
But it is, that is a simple example. And actually the spider diagram is often used for the so-called small world uh, problem so that we all connected by I think six connections from each other. So that's the diagram coming from that setting. But by choosing the right people in your community and focusing your resources onto these people, you will have a way larger effect than by not choosing these people. And we've done that quite consistently. And that's, I think, that we consider one of the reasons why we have been moving or well, been able to move so fast and really do something for melanoma patients where, where we're coming from. But that's, a, that's something that anyone can apply. That's not specific to our network. And with that, uh, I would like to, to end my part before I hand over to Violetta, who will explain how we anticipate education needs. Something that I consider actually, this is the backbone, this is the source, and this is the one most important thing, how our forums, um, what makes our forums safe. And I should probably have made it red or put a big explanation mark. The most important thing, and this is one of our main principles, our principle is called data, not opinions. We always ask everyone to support their claims with evidence. And if you're able to establish that on any group you're running, any forum and any discussion, if you make this the standard culture, that's the one magic trick that allows you to control the quality of what's happening in any group. Once everyone has understood why this is so important, it is also the bit that becomes self-enforcing because people will ask, even when you are asleep, as soon as someone else puts something out there, they say, where did you get that from? And that is the one most helpful thing in order to keep a community safe and set up something like a self-controlling mechanism. That doesn't mean that you can go away forever, but it allows, it gives you that breathing space and it empowers people to actually take control of their own environment. And with that, Violetta, over to you. So uh, what is great about forums is that allow you to anticipate your community educational needs. And uh, strange enough, we didn't try this exercise in our forums, in Melanoma forums, but we did it for uh, uh, share for rare um, in, within a forum uh, of rare diseases. So keep in mind that the number, the diversity and the level of the of the question that we actually receive on a forum is uh, very much depending on how good we are uh, or you are in educating your people. Generally, we, we agree that especially at the start uh, of a forum, uh, people actually don't know um, how and what to ask um, in order to be helped, but, but it's changing uh, little by little in, in time. So uh, uh, what we did uh, here, here we have, um, this is an image of uh, question and uh, answer uh, share for air forums, forum uh, that we recently started. And uh, actually what we did was to pick up the questions, each, each of this branch of different color, it's a, it's a, it's a question, it's a, it's a person asking a question. And we pick up all these questions from carers and patients and we transfer them on Google. This is a web application that helps you to organize content. And I think it's, it's very nice to, to try it once for, uh, for your own uh, community. Um, of course, it will be interesting to, to make bigger this, uh, this diagram. But for now, I will go like this. What we did. Um, then was to group all our questions by areas of uh, patient uh, interest and like you, uh, as you can see here uh, by uh, different colors we identified uh, six educational needs um, it's uh, most of this uh, question were concerning uh, um, were, were from people that are looking for, uh, for people uh, with the same disease in rare disease you have uh, uh, patients that are scattered everywhere with different uh, genetical mutation and then they are disparate to, to find somebody like them uh, then we had another topic um, concerning collaboration, there are patient organizations that are asking for collaboration, and then we had a lot of questions about disease and uh, and genetics that is normal in the rare disease area, um, and uh, bunches of questions about treatment, research, and clinical trials, national uh, uh, networks, healthcare, national care. 
pardon, National Healthcare and European Healthcare and the European Reference Network. This is not unexpected. Um, um, form was screened the, uh, over three months. You can see that uh, the amount of questions is not very, very large because there is a start, a slow start in, in, in every forum, but enough to pick up uh, the, the interest of, of people. Uh, and, and even more than that, because uh, we know from our experience that each of these big topics, like we have he here six, uh, six topics, um, are hiding uh, somehow uh, more granular needs of the, of the community. So, for example, if you go in the area of, um, where is that, clinical trials here with RED, and if you can zoom on that, which I could do if I will be in, in uh, Google, then um, then uh, you can see that uh, um, each of the, that the topic about clinical trials are actually it's it's hiding it's um, having other underlying educational needs of the, of the of the patients, and this could be um, how I can search for a clinical trial. Uh, how I can select the best one for my condition, um, how I can understand the science behind the clinical trial in order to choose a good one, or how I can get involved in the research in order to influence the, the research that concerns me. So uh, at the end, uh, what is important for you maybe as a patient uh, organization is that, that you can pick up this, uh, this educational uh, needs that are obvious or the underlying needs that are not obvious, but you can subtract for, from the big uh, topics and you can transform them in a <clears throat> workshop, face-to-face -face meetings, educational courses, or you can, uh, or, or simply you can, uh, for, for, uh, for the um, education of larger uh, communities or your communities, or you can simply transform them in educational posts within your, your private forum. And with that, I would like to hand it to, to Gilly, I think. Thanks. Thanks very much, Violetta, for that. Um, and I'm just going to finish off a little bit with online collaboration. And I, I can't really think of a better time. Uh, to do this because all of us are having to collaborate online. The disruption that COVID-19 has caused has meant that uh, we're pretty uh, well involved in this now. So we online collaboration has, has various challenges for us. Um, largely, as Bettina already mentioned at the beginning, we are we are we work in a very asynchronous way. Uh, sometimes we're on completely different time zones. Uh, some of us are, 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 are full time workers, so we only do it in the evening. So it's it's quite a difficult uh, working environment. We're not all sitting around the same desk in the same office. So we need to use tools to make this easier. We also have this a very diverse and changing audiences. We have people who come in and out, uh, patients who get better or improved or no longer need to feel part of the forum, or we have volunteers who are coming in and get an intense bit of training and then they go off or they're more involved in something else. Um, and then the last thing is, is cost. None of us have any money really, so we don't really want to be spending lots of money on tools that uh, you know, aren't actually benefiting us in some way. But it's also worth looking that there are some useful things to look at. Um, there are IT free IT donations that you can get. Um, if, for example, like TechSoup, which is an organ organization that supplies technical information and support to patient organizations and not-for-profits. Um, I noticed just recently they have quite a cool little uh, webinar on how to use Excel properly. And it's certainly something that I will have a have a dip into as we get new updates all the time. Um, then also just just to mention here, Google Ad Grants. You know, if you if you have a promotion or if you have a, an event or you want people to find you, you can get Google Ad Grants from Google. Who if you register and this is is given for free and it's really worth worthwhile looking into this. It's very easy to search. And then always ask for special discounts for patient organizations on all the t technologies that you might use. We've certainly managed to um, break them down to a very low rate by saying, surely you're not going to charge a patient organization a not-for-profit the same rate. So never be afraid to ask. Um, then the tools to look out for. So we all have different tools that for, di for different needs. 
group communication. You know, we, so as Violetta expanded earlier, we use Slack for all our internal communications. It's easy to put it in projects. It's easy to have certain teams. Um, teleconference, obviously, we're on this now. Go to meeting, we use. We find it great. You can have go to webinars. You can have all kinds of things. Um, and you need a certain amount of internal and external uh, tool in a way. So this is an external tool. We can have people from everywhere, whereas Slack, you can keep it completely informal and you can just have one or two people on a channel and only you can invite them in. Joint working, Google Suite. This is something I hated Google Suite before. Um, and with uh, all this uh, uh, time that we have to ourselves to, to develop uh, and understand tools better, we use the Google Suite more and more. And we use um, Google Forms and Google Sheets and Google Docs because we can share it and add things and comment on things. And no one is reproducing or, or, or doing the same work because we're all in, in con constant communication. Um, specific purposes, you have things like Miro for brainstorming. Shared calendars is something that we use so that each all of us know what each of us are doing. And then again, you're not reproducing work. Scheduling meetings, again, that, Doodle Doodle is good, useful for that. Surveys, Survey Monkey, there's hundreds of things. Google Forms, we also use for surveys. Educational tools we use. We like our little Kahoot where you can um, d define a little quiz to test people, like at, at your your meet your internal meetings or your external meetings. You can you can have a little quiz on, on your particular disease area. It's quite a good educational tool. Project management, another one. There's lots of things you can use. And then there's the organization administration. So Google Forms, financial tools, mapping your hours. This is something we are notoriously you know battling to to really be good at because you never you can't imagine how many much time it takes to to help one per one patient to find the answers that they need you know it's it's 60 to 90 minutes just in in a, in a you know so it's good Ma map all this and always keep testing your tools because there's new integrations tools become better um you, you suddenly find that now you know what you really need to do the tool that you were using because that was the first one you started is no longer appropriate so keep testing keep 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 agile. Keep uh, you know. Pass a little bit of your weekend to to find a new tool that might help you with your financial management a bit better. Um, and with that, I think we're we're almost at the end here. So I'm going to hand over to to Suzanne. I'd like to thank everybody for their interest in this webinar. Um, in case you are, this webinar has piqued your interest in organizing an activity, whether it's online or offline, uh, next Wednesday we're hosting a webinar on how to organize a successful rare disease activity. And this comes for best practices in the rare disease field for over 10 years. Uh, we invite two experts from the John Walton Muscular Dystrophy Research Centre at Newcastle University to speak on this, so we can learn from this. Um, so if you head over to shareforrare.org, you can register for this webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining and uh, hope to see you next week. Thanks very much.